Welcome to the aggressive life today. Imagine, if you will, whatever your career is, reaching the pinnacle of success in that career and then walking away. That's exactly the type of aggressive move we like to see around here, the moves that are a bit unusual and unorthodox, and it's exactly the move that my friend Justin made and why we're going to talk to him today. For him, the choice to walk away wasn't a snap decision that he made in the moment. It wasn't based on feelings or even deep strategy. Instead, it was the culmination of one risky yes followed by another risky yes and a cascading line of more aggressive yeses. I might add here that so oftentimes when we say no, we're not being aggressive. We're just being conservative. Conservative is not being aggressive. Saying no oftentimes is based on fear. There are some things I should say no to. I should say no to some woman who comes on at me at the bar. Not that I'm at the bar very often, <laughs> and nor that I can even recall a time a woman came on to me at the bar, at least not since I've been like 32. <laughs> I mean, that, that's something you should say no to anyway. That, that, that's a good idea. But it's the aggressive things that we go after they have to say yes to. Those are the difficult ones. After six years of touring and four albums, Carrollton had reached pinnacles other bands only dream about. For one, they were actually making money from live music. That's a rarity. Their hit single, Made For This, was featured everywhere from the United States promotion for the 2018 Winter Olympics to commercials for Jeep, the NFL, and the NCAA. Later that same year, they'd been nominated for Rock Album of the Year at the Dove Awards. As the lead singer of Carrollton, Justin Mosteller, he worked incredibly hard to achieve those levels of success, and most of it happened. After he told the band he was finished, three years later, he's sitting with me today in the studio. He's one of the principal songwriters and singers for Crossroads Music, which is a collective of worship artists based out of my day job, a pastor. And so actually, he has to be here today. It's part of his job to just do whatever I say. And he ended up showing up here at Crossroads Church, our Oakley location in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, and he's actually going to play some live music for us today. That's a first, huh, Dirt? We never, we ne- we've never had actually live music inside of the studio. It's going to be great. And he's going to play a song that was written that is very, very close to me and uh, is actually one of my calling cards. Kind of, kind of crazy when someone hears something you say and they write a, write a song about it. And so that's what this song we're going to do at some point today. And maybe we'll have him do something else like, I don't know, like Happy Birthday or Free Bird or something like that. Something, something real difficult. Can you do Free Bird? Do you know how to do Free no. Bird? No. No? No. You call yourself I'm, a guitarist. You can't play Free no, Bird. No, I said yes to never learning that song. Are you so serious? So that every time it's called for, I can go, nope, can't do it. Really? Yes. What is your problem, man? <laughs> I know. Come you're, on. You're white, you're a male, <laughs> and you're about middle age. Why, why would am. you not know any Leonard Skinner? I don't. We, got, we have to verify here that you're an actual musician. So before we get into music talk, why don't you do something for us? What, what, what song are you going to sing right now? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be selfish. I'm going to play my favorite song uh, that I've written over the years. And uh, I wrote it for my wife, so this is like brownie points that I'm using your podcast for. I hope you're cool with that. Yeah. So, this is a song called Rebuilder. It's slow, so don't tear up too much, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> And the wreckage I'd forgotten who I was But you reached out for my hand And you found me in the dust Oh, my soul had given up But you wouldn't leave me undone Rebuilder My walls were crumbling Restore You brought the light into the room And you filled my lungs So I could learn to breathe again My shelter 
You're my warmth in the coldest night, my helper. You held me up till I could stand on the promise that you are rebuilding me. Now I have seen the dawn. Start to break between the cracks and the beginnings of a day I never thought would come to pass. Yeah, you brought me back to life. Well, you were the morning in my night. Stand on the promise that you are rebuilding me to the man I am today. With all my fear and shame, you rescued my heart and showed me the joy I can come through pain. You brought dancing to these streets, my second chance for peace. My walls were crumbling. Restore. You brought the light into the room, and it filled my lungs so I could learn to breathe. My shelter, oh, my warmth in the coldest night. My helper, you held me up till I could stand. On the promise that you are rebuilding me, well, you promise that you are rebuilding me. Hey, that's good stuff. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, brother. Yeah, man. So you start off the rum, the rubble, and the wreckage. What's the rubble and wreckage that you were dealing with when you wrote that song? Well, I, so I, I said that song was for my wife. Yeah. Um, but before I married Sarah, I, I went through divorce. I was married for seven years and um, went through divorce right before I turned 30. I married young, you know, and going through that, it was awful. It's, it's terrible. You know, you think something is forever, and, um, and it turns out it wasn't, you know. And so the— pain of that the not trusting yourself anymore not trusting uh, not trusting others you know and um the pain and and loss from that of um i failed i lost what was closest to me and dearest to me and um had never experienced loss like that and during it praying for (laughs) praying for healing, praying for God to reconcile, bring healing, all the things, and seeing it not turn out like I prayed, you know, was a, was a massive crisis of faith and as, a, as just a, as a man going, I, I failed. And a part of that for me was I, I didn't know uh, my biological father left when I was four years old, divorced my mom and left my brother and me. When I went through divorce, I immediately thought, Am I just going to be be like him? Am I going to turn out like him? And so there was, a, there was a lot of wreckage just in that moment from that. Well, we're glad you came through it. And you came through it pretty good. You got a great wife, got four kids who every time I see them, they're like sinless. Have your kids ever committed a sin? Because it doesn't look like it to me. Yeah, let me tell you. <laughs> I can tell you some stories. <laughs> but it, it is. We've been, Sarah and I have been married 10 years now. Uh, our four kids now, nine years old, nine, seven, six, and, and four. And... Yeah, it it is amazing, you know, and um, and it it's uh, it's amazing, and 
at times it feels like, well, this has been forever. And then I pause and go, no, it wasn't. I, I know what it's like to have loss like that. And I, I think people see us now, married 10 years, and they see my kids and they're like, oh, you just had it easy. You just, I mean, like, you've always been a singer and it's always worked out for you. Like, no, let me tell you about the 10 years of my 20s. Yeah. There was some, a, a lot of loss there. So tell us about music. When did you know you were going to make a living off of music? <laughs> Never. You know, it, like, it seemed like, uh, it seemed, it's, it seemed like there's no way. I, I remember every time I would talk about music, it was always, well, what's your fallback plan? I don't know. I, what do I, what do you mean? You know, my uncles and, uh, things who had MBAs and going like, well, you need to go to school and do this. Like, okay. But for me, it was, music was always a part of, I mean, I started super young, like many people in music, it was sort of connected to the church, but you know, my mom has tapes of me singing as a four-year-old, you know, singing church songs, Jehovah Jireh. Remember that song? And all all these, right? How's that song go? Oh gosh. Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider. His grace is sufficient for me, for me. You don't know this? No, the song sucks. I'm glad exactly. I don't know that. Exactly. I, I was expecting you to blow me away. That did nothing for me. No, of course not. I was four. <laughs> to, to be clear, Jehovah Jireh doesn't suck. He's amazing. He's awesome. That's, yeah. He, That's another name for, for God, everybody. Yeah. Right. Anyway, <laughs> all, but I grew up around church, grew up singing choir stuff, and... Um, I didn't start playing guitar till college, though. I mean, I, I just grew up really? singing. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was all the singing stuff. I mean, it was a, it was a, a guy at my church. I was a baseball player. I thought I was going to play baseball forever. That was the thing. I thought I was going to um, play baseball. I was dedicated to baseball, all the stuff. And then a youth pastor at my church was like, hey, we need somebody to lead us in songs at church. I'm like, what is? What do you mean? I don't know what that is. He's like, well, I know you sing, and you do choir and stuff like that. I was like, all right. That was my freshman year of high school, and um, man, he just gave he gave me a shot. Like, here, I need I need your help. Can you do this? And I've been leading worship in some form, playing music ever since then. You know, I loved music, but he's the first one that sort of put it on the map, and then. And then I was like, I, th- I, I think I'm not going to have a future in baseball because mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have any warning track power or, or yeah. any home run power. And laid it down and just, just showed up and just started learning music. But So you didn't start singing or playing until college. Uh, you didn't finish college then? No, I did finish you college. You did finish. But okay. I, didn't, I didn't start playing guitar until college. So I turned 18. Okay. I moved here to Cincinnati. And... Um, knew I just well my cousin and I would play music together all growing up my cousin and I were best friends he played guitar he was great I never needed to learn guitar because he did it and then we went our separate ways and I was like well this sucks I can't (laughs) I can't play a song so it just it just forced me into it I got a guitar from a girlfriend at the time (laughs) and uh and started playing guitar in college and started writing music at about 18. So the masters what was what you were being pushed on, not going to college. The masters, you said your uncle said, "Hey, you got to have something to fall back on." Every step of the way, yeah. yeah, was like was like that. That's right. I read an interview with George Clooney. Oh, this was a long, 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 long time ago, and his dad was pushing on him when he was a young younger guy. He was kind of the heartthrob in oh an old tv show called the facts of life Mm -hmm. and he decided to try making a career of it but his dad wasn't having any part of it which is you know his dad is george clooney senior i mean made quite a name for him in the the show business Mm -hmm. and i'll never forget the the line was he said son you got to have something to fall back on and george clooney said dad if i have something to fall back on then i'll fall back Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like brilliant wisdom coming from him now, but of course, there's a lot of people who misuse that. That's right. That wisdom, but uh, that's that. That's really that's really interesting that you you've been able to make it. When I say make it, you're not making millions, but you're feeding your family, playing music. When did you know that you're going to be able to actually put food on the table and pay some bills through your great voice and guitar? I mean, that it took shape in college. You know, I started getting things, and, and you know this about me, but not all listeners certainly don't know me. 
it was it was ministry focused there in college for me that it became a, a ministry thing and I was gonna I mean I didn't start the band until I was uh what 27 28 and so making music that way as a band totally different than making music in church and making a living on a pastor you know or being a pastor so college though was when things started to hit and started playing gigs and and then leading worship as well and doing things like that started to connect Tell us the story about when you met Lauren Daigle. <laughs> so I was just telling this the other day. So Lauren is a, a wee bit more popular than I am. Yeah, I think certainly. she's going to make it. I think I she think, In fact, she's not just putting food in the table. She's putting caviar in her third house in France, probably. She put, I, I will say, uh, she put some food on my table because we were signed to the same record label. And so... Uh, an artist like that who hits big like that, everybody everybody reaps the benefits of that around it. But Lauren and I met when no one no one knew who Lauren was, no no one knew who we were. We were independent artists. We our band had put out an album that had gotten some recognition. A guy calls me, says, "Hey, we we I, I work for this record label. I didn't know who the record label was." Said, "Hey, we we love independent artists, and we want to help you in your craft." And so we'll bring you out to this four-day retreat um, out in Seattle, Washington, and we'll give you all of our people. Like, we'll bring in our business folks, we'll bring in our creatives, our design folks, songwriters, and you'll be with 20 other independent artists. No strings attached. We cover your flight, all your food for four days, and we just want to help you. And I was like, this is a lie. (laughs) Who's this guy? But called friends. We ended up going out there to Washington, and, and Lauren was invited onto that same retreat. And uh, I was just literally two nights ago telling somebody the story and pulled out a photo of all of us. And and from there, uh, we were two of the folks out of that 20 independent artists that the record label ended up signing from that retreat. So they said they were trying to build into you. They were actually just trying to was, scout some talent. Yeah, it was American which Idol, yeah. which is great. And, and it was more effective than come to Nashville and meet us in our sphere. No, let's put you in a in a four day thing where we hang out with you and we're having drinks at night and we're, we're seeing you songwrite and how you collaborate and how you learn. And, um, and both of us got signed from that. Remember them calling us and saying, we want to sign you all. And they brought us to Nashville at that point. They said, you got any questions? And my first one was why, why, <laughs> why us? Like we got so much to learn. I'd went through 40 sheets of paper on that retreat and uh, and that was part of it for us, for them. The connection was, I saw your work ethic in four days. I saw how much you learned. And you have talent. That's no, you know, whatever. But there was this, like, no, you all set yourselves apart because all four of you, we were four of us in the band. You're learners. You want it. You, or you're hungry. You want this. And so, anyway, Lauren and I, we, our band and her uh, got signed to that label, Centricity Music, and... And then did several tours together there at the start. I mean, um, yeah, it's it's hysterical now looking back what she's been able to do, and I will, no one had any idea then, no one, and and she didn't. She's pure-hearted, man. She's great, and so we got to do several Christmas tours with her and felt like Big Brothers, being her backing band. We were her band. I'd sing BGVs with her and blah blah blah. It, was it wasn't. Great. So you're saying it wasn't like at that event. She opened up her mouth, and she had stellar pipes in the in angels danced. It wasn't like this obvious great vocal talent. You're saying no, back then? it was obvious that she opened her mouth, and everybody went whoa, you know. But but it takes more, right? I mean, like it it is a does she have what it takes to to be able to speak to a crowd every night and to be able to inspire people that way? Does she have the songwriting ability? Does she have the character to withstand the uh, you know, the, all that comes with the spotlight, that, that type of deal. And I don't think any, she was super young. She was super green. She was there as a background vocalist to another band. She wasn't there as a lead vocalist and had her own music. Really? Yeah. All this stuff. So, um, so I don't think anybody had a clue, but the owner of the record label, he and his wife said, I think there's something on her and we will sign her no matter what. You know, you mentioned the work ethic. I think that's really cool that that record label is looking to see that work ethic. It it reminds me of a section of scripture in the New Testament, which gives qualifications for elders, which are the 
senior most authority in a local church. And one of the verses has traditionally been translated that an elder must be able to teach. It's one of the qualifications mm-hmm. for being an elder, along with, you know, husband of one wife, meaning you're not a womanizer or a manizer, and, you know, not given over to too much wine, all that kind of stuff. But I, I learned that in the Greek, it can go either way. It can be able to teach, or it can be teachable. Really? Yeah. And I'll tell you, I've served with a, a, a lot of elders who are able to teach, but it's the ones that are teachable that you want to be with. There, there's not a, there's not a lot of people that really are up for learning new things. Totally. And undergoing the discipline to get proficient yeah. in a new thing. That's right. Yeah, it takes a whole level of humility. I mean, that we talk about it a lot around here, even with Crossroads Music and with worship, but we talked uh, as a band. At one point in our, in our band story, you know, one of the original members got out a few years before I did. And that was the, you, you ask any band who's toured and been on the road, you are not looking for the best musician when you replace a band member. You're looking for who can hang. Because mm. I'm, I'm on the bus or I'm in the van for, you know, 23 hours of that day or whatever, and I'm on stage for an hour. And, yeah, you can be great on the stage, and that has its place. But that idea of teachability and, and caring for others or humility or oh, I'm learning new things. Yeah, I need you to do this tonight, not just play guitar and not just be a amazing guitarist. No, you got to connect with people tonight. You know, so take a ten on the relatability aspect. Who has only an an eight in terms of skill versus somebody who's ten in musicianship and a five in skill or Absolutely. something? Like that. I mean, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly right. Matters huge. Yeah, there there are so few people that find a craft and then master it, and the the music thing is an indicting one for all of us because all of us at one point were probably forced to take piano lessons right. you know or guitar lessons yeah. and and all of us can tell can remember when we just stopped doing it we didn't want to put in the time didn't make any sense to us yeah and when we see someone like you who is who's making it and is skilled like i know there's a lot a lot of hours outside the public eye getting you to a place where you could actually be in the public eye Sure. A, a lot of hours and a lot of failures, <laughs> you know? I mean, you ask anybody, I picked up a guitar. I was 17 years old when I started college. Uh, and, and I picked up a guitar. I sucked. I was terrible. And you ask anybody well, that, that I went to college yeah. with, like, I remember graduating. I graduated with a music degree and a, and a biblical studies degree combination thing. And, um, first to graduate with that degree, me and another buddy. And so we were guinea pigs. But I remember uh, if you graduate with a music degree at the end, you sit in front of a board of like five or six professors and peers to give you feedback uh, of uh, your time in music. And they've done that throughout your time. You've done recitals and performed for them and all this stuff. And I remember one of the guys, my senior year, I'm graduating, and he says, he lived three dorms down from me or three uh, rooms down from me our freshman year. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm just, uh, man, I'm, I'm blown away by where you are today because you were terrible when you started. Horrible. I remember learning guitar for a year on my own. I'd just go to different people and learn, and, and I played all the time. And I remember I, I played that summer with a guy that I really respected that was doing music for a living, and I really loved him and thought he was great. And he, he called me and said, hey, will you come play this thing with me? I go. And he said, great, will you play this song? I start playing, and he literally stops me. I've been playing guitar for a year. I can sing. I feel like I'm making the thing, right? And he stops me and says, what are you doing? I was like, playing the song. No, you're not. You're not playing it right. You're skipping a beat there this way. And, and he, I go, okay, well, show me. And he shows me, and he just said, you're going to have to relearn. Just start over, and here's how you start over. And he gave me a metronome and said, you start doing this every day. Practice this way. After a year, I had to relearn. So it's a bunch of hours, and it's a bunch of no's and failures and people going, no. I mean, I had auditions that uh, people said, nope, don't have it. 
next, you know, and it's the, it's a matter of if you want to show back up and what are you willing to put in? So you finally get to the top, top. I mean, there's always somebody who's way, way above you, but you, yes. you're, you're like hyper respectable musician getting a very, very wide following blue skies ahead of you and you leave it for a church gig. What? Why? Well, sort of. Okay. So not totally for the church gig. I it, those were two separate things for me. We were going here to church. We were we were part of Crossroads and uh, had been here for a year and a half, just going to the church and in, in here. But I was entering my tenth year of the band, and I just began to really look at: Is this the best thing? I had four kids. Uh, there was nothing broken at home, like nothing was breaking. My wife wasn't panicked about anything or saying, you got to stop. I and mean, she was shocked when I said, I'm, I'm done. But for me, it became a, a question of, is this the best thing? It's always going to be good. We were doing ministry. We weren't just a band playing bars and trying to get popular, whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, I guess. But that just wasn't us. It was ministry. We were helping people. And I just kept saying, is it the best thing? It's always going to be good. But I feel like the way I'm wired, I think I can be a better husband, be a better father, be a better friend if I'm planted somewhere at home. And if I'm local as opposed to going spot to spot every weekend. And um, and so that became more of the question. And, and that meant, am I going to have to quit music to provide for my family? And that was a real thing. I thought I was going to have to leave music. And in the process of saying I'm done with the band um, is when the church came in and said, hey, we'd like to talk to you about a job. And that sort of dovetailed there. Great. But that, it wasn't that a part of the original. The band was amazing. This is three of my best friends. And we were doing better than ever. And yet that business for me, that industry, it is a business. It is an industry no matter how you love it. We'd, we'd be on the road with guys who were 10 years ahead of us, and I'd still hear them saying, the next single is going to do it. The next single we release, I think that's going to put us over this. Oh, we're going to get this. And I just went, you're 10 years ahead of us. You've had number one after number one, and you're still chasing something that I'm not cut out to chase, really. you know. And I just saw that, that thing about it and went, I don't think that's the best thing for me. I think the best thing is for me to line up with my wiring, how I'm made up, and man, here's the callings I have. I'm called to be a husband, I'm called to be a father, called to be a great friend, a pastor, some of those things that are inherent in me, and went, I, I got to put it all on the table and see what needs to fall off to be the best at those things. What about age as a musician and for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no secret that as we get older, we lose our vocal capacity, you know, we, uh, most of us do yeah. anyway. Yep. <clears throat> and of course, if you're trying to earn your living in music in the American church, there's a fixation with youth and skinny jeans, That's right. which you are pretty skinny. <laughs> actually, you are, yeah, you've, you've I, lost a lot of weight. You're fairly lost, skinny right now. My last three months in the band, man, I lost, I lost that weight. Justin works with a guy named Craig, Greg McElfrish, and they both lost their hair, and they've lost a lot of weight, so I call them the Lose Brothers. That's right. <laughs> the Lose Brothers. Okay, so yeah, at some point, you're going to lose your youth. Have you thought about that? I mean, do you just plan on being a worship leader till 65, one of the very few? Because I, I would love that to happen. Or do you think you'll get tired of it? Or what, you know, what, what, what do you think about that in the future? I think, yeah, at some point, especially the way churches are these days with going, we got to get, we got to get younger on the stage primarily and even musically. I just go like, man, I need to surround myself with younger folks who help me get better and those things. But at some point, sure, I think there's a, a shelf life on some level to singing musically and, and all those things. I mean, I've always said like, I could wake up tomorrow and not be able to not have a voice. It's a real thing. Well, you can ha have youth and skinny jeans on a stage, a bunch, a bunch of people on the stage, you've got that. But man, there's just something about a worship leader who's had the tar kicked out of him over decades that has a richness and a depth to them. Like the one song just uh, really annoys me. I like the song a lot. 
I would just, I would just like this is a. Be good. I want to hear this. Yeah, we we sing it here at Crossroads. Um, oh, how's it go? It goes. Uh, uh, I've searched the world <laughs> and it couldn't fill That's right. me. That's right. And that was written by a twenty-something-year-old. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've not searched the freaking world. That's right. That's you, right. You've not searched it. You, you, you have not. Yep. You, you probably haven't even been to the Grand Canyon. You haven't even been out of the United States. Probably never got high either. You haven't, you haven't <laughs> freaking searched the world. I mean, it's, That's it's, right. a, it's, I think it's a true concept. But if someone who is 65, who's been around a bunch of corners, someone who's 50 sings that, there's just a different depth to it. Yeah. And I think that we're we're missing that in the American church is that that depth and wisdom coming through in our in our worship songs mm-hmm. is not there as it could be. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if it's because as church leaders we're pushing out older people or if those of you who are getting older just man it's just a hard gig to do. I just I, I don't want to do it anymore. What do, what's your thoughts on that? I I mean I don't think there's a shelf life to leadership. You know what I mean? If you've got core character, depth of character, vulnerability, even teachability, like we like go back to that. I mean, just learning new skills. Sure, that can help. But the character and leadership, I don't think there's a shelf life for. So can you develop other folks that can carry some of that weight so that you don't need me at 60 on stage every weekend? You know, am I am I developing and, and am I pushing other leaders? You know, I. Yeah, I I believe yeah there there will be a there's a shelf life to all of us on the, some there's some performance level there there's some all, all those things, but man if you've got depth of character if you've searched the world in in as much as you can or whatever, I hope there's no shelf life to that. I could be around worship and music for the rest of my life. I think in that capacity. You know, I was listening to this morning. We're going down a rabbit hole. This is can be a very fresh podcast for many people. For others, it's like boring. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right because I say many times it's my podcast. I don't do what I want That's to. Right. You know, I was listening to this morning. I was I was headed out to hunt. I hunted again this morning, so I was out of the house at five thirty, trying to get in the deer stand and and uh, listen to Russ Taff. Oh. You heard much uh, Russ Taft? I know of Russ Taft. Okay. Yeah. But so, not listen a ton to him. Interesting. No. Uh, I, I, I'll send you a few tracks. Come on with it. The dude, I mean, I mean, it's old school, cheesy instrumentation and arrangement, but there, there's just a depth there. I haven't listened to him actually for decades. I think it's the last one I heard. I popped my mind the what song. What made you go to it? Uh, there's a phrase that's in one of his songs that I've been saying a lot. And, and I thought, I wonder if that song's as good as I thought it was, because this phrase, this lyric, has been in my mind for the last couple years. I should go back and listen to the song. Um, and it was, the, the, the song was called, I Still Believe. Mm. And he starts off, I've been in a cave for 40 days. And he kind of goes through stuff and he's counting the costs and he says, but you know, I still believe. And that just got me on the Russ Taff channel on Spotify. And I was like, oh my gosh, there was that one. Oh, and there was that one. I mean, some of them, I don't like that, but fast forward, like, yeah. oh man, like one of them, uh, I-, I wanted to do some research on. I'm curious if you even have done this. It's an, he was a, he was the younger guy in this old, old band called the Imperials. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. like one of the earliest Christian bands, yep. which... You know, back to be a Christian band in 1980, if you just had a guitar, you were a band, right? Because everything right. else was an organ. Yeah. And and the front covers, they're basically in white leisure suits, walking to him and his two other buddies, and he was the young guy in it. And there's a um, there's a song in there that, uh, that I just listened to before we came to the podcast. Like, where is that song? I found it. And it was uh, Praise the Lord Because He Inhabits Our Praise. Okay. Is, was the line. I mean, it, the verses are like, um, Satan is a liar and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself, we're children of the king. Mm-hmm. So rise up, you mighty man of God, for the battle must be won because Jesus Christ is risen and the work's already done. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord. Like God inhabits our praise. I I think that is in the Bible. Have you done much research on that? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a psalm. 
I I cannot remember. Maybe Dirt has the the memory of it. Uh, I just I just read it the other day because I shared it with a a group uh, uh, that I was leading worship for. Psalm twenty two. Psalm twenty two. Yeah, the Lord inhabits Dirt's not his that praise. Smart. He's got a smartphone. He's got his phone. He he went to the phone, but <laughs> yeah, he is pretty dang smart. He is. Uh, Psalm twenty two. The Lord inhabits his praise, and I I think what I I'll just say what I said to our people the other day with that verse, like. I don't think that's like a, 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 a magic switch that, well, if I sing a worship song, it means the Lord's just automatically, he's, he's like there in all of his power and things, because I could sing it and not mean it. He inhabits his praise, because praise is going, you're supreme and I'm not. Praise is putting him in the rightful place, and therefore, I'm recognizing that he's enthroned on it. One, some, some translation says he, he's enthroned on his praises. Hmm. Well, Yeah because I'm recognizing he's the king. And so I'm giving him the proper glory rather than just, if, well, if I sing a song about Jesus, he's there. You know, it's like, no, no, it's all about heart posture. It's all, it's, it's going, no, you're the king. Which is why no. I always know there's a cap on someone's spiritual formation when they just don't sing. Mm. You mm. know, I know people who mm -hmm. say they follow Christ, been baptized, read the Bible, but they just won't sing. Mm. They, they just won't do it. And I'm like, man, you're, there, there's a whole new level you're missing out on. And that verse reminds me of it because he inhabits his praise. He's in it. Yeah. When we do that, he's, he's uniquely present in it. Absolutely. And it unlocks something. I mean, even for you, look at the power of music. Like, you're able to remember those lyrics. When's the first time you heard a Russ Taft song? 20 years ago? 30? Oh, shoot. No, I bet the first time I heard a Russ Taft song that... Uh, when the Imperials was 1981. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. That's the year I was born, by the way. And, wow. <laughs> and the fact that that imprinted itself on you, it unlocked something in you that has stuck with you, holds that moment for you. All these years later, you bring it back up. Like That's what I think people don't realize when we're saying, un uh, open yourself up to expressing yourself in music. It's all over scripture. It's all over history. But it does something unique. It did it to you this morning. Oh, I don't know what Russ Taft's pipes are like right now, but I can promise you if Russ Taft was leading worship someplace, I would go. Right. And so if you ever want to get out of the worship gig, fine. I, I support you. I'm with you. But I want to be around you for a long, long time. So I hope we're one of those guys who lasts a long, long time. I appreciate time. that, man. All right, hey, let's get the guitar here. We got a guitar over oh, here. Let's, we got let's it. just tease us. Tell, us. tell us first this song that you're going to do for us. What is it? It's called Anything to Bless Your Heart. And uh, it's a song we just released, this Crossroads Music, just uh, about a month ago. And it's a song that, uh, set, you know, we're a collective here, so we got a bunch of songwriters. I actually didn't have a part in writing this song. You had more of a part in writing this song. So th it came from your prayer that you talk about both, uh, well, in plenty of places, but in your book and Phantom Lake and things like that. Uh, what are you doing today, God, and how can I be a part? And so... Uh, one of our singers, Erica, one of our ladies uh, who's amazing, she started writing this little hook. What are you doing today, God? How can I be a part? And that started the the whole song from there. You know, when we get together to, to write songs, we'll often go, hey, here's something our people have been hearing a bunch. Here's something we've been saying as a church. Let's Let's see if we can put voice to that, put a melody to it. And this song is just a pure, it's a, it's a song stinking that people should have daily, not because we made it, but because it's the right prayer for every day. God, what are you doing today? And how can I be a part? And ultimately, my I, I'm here to bless you, Lord, not to bless myself, but to be a blessing to you. Where did that, I'm curious for you, I think you'll have more even behind this song because it came from your words. Where did that, was that a prayer from someone else? Was that just a prayer? Uh, it was. It's very fascinating. You should bring this up today mm. because just... Three days ago, I got back from the funeral of Denny Patton, yeah. one of the most popular podcasts we've ever had here at The Aggressive Life was when Denny came in when he had weeks to live. Yeah. And uh, he's a guy who brought me to Christ, discipled me, brought me into leadership, all that stuff. He had weeks to live. And well, <laughs> of course, not Denny, because after his weeks turned into months and months. I think he probably told me he had weeks to live just so we'd get in the podcast and pump his product. 
<laughs> that's exactly what that's exactly what Denny would do. You would totally do that. That's great. You know, it was like he always pushed. He's pushing up the very end. He's in a hospice. He goes in hospice. He decides to start writing a book on how to die. It was a, a, amazing. I remember listening to that podcast when it came out. Gosh. Listening to his drive and his care about Crazy. other people. Crazy. He was on another guy's podcast like uh, two months later. And I said to him, I said, dude, die already. Well, yeah, just, just die. It was, you were supposed to be two weeks. Like, you keep going and going. I think this is a, a fundraising mode for you. But he uh, just, uh, he really stunning, stunning man. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing about it now. Boy, I had a lot of tears a few days ago. You know, because you just, you just miss him. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, you, there's just, there's a backstop that I don't have right now, mm. you know. But the guy who led him to Christ, and mentored him is the one who taught me that, that really? thing. Yeah, Reed Carpenter. Every day I wake up, say, God, whatever you got going on today, I want to be a part of it. Yeah. So that came through Reed and Denny, that, uh, this song. Wow. Well, why don't you sing this song for us? Let's do it. There ain't a better time than now to be wherever you want me Cause I know that you're working Already There ain't a better place in this To hear whatever you will say Cause I know that you're speaking I'm ready oh. What are you doing today, God? How can I be a part? What are you doing today, God? And how can I bless your heart? I just want to bless your heart. I just want to bless your heart. Every day I wake up, I just want to give you anything to bless your heart. There ain't a better song to sing Surrender is the melody With every breath I breathe in I'm singing, oh I'm singing, yeah And what are you doing today, God? And how can I be a part, oh What are you doing today, God? Yeah, yeah, yeah And how can I bless your heart? Yeah, I just want to bless your heart I just want to bless your heart Every day I wake up I just want to give you anything to bless your heart At all times, through all things Anything to bless your heart I'll run or I'll wait Anything to bless your heart at all times, through all things, anything to bless your heart. And I'll run or I'll wait, anything to bless your heart. At all times, through all things, anything to bless your heart. And I'll run or I'll wait, anything to bless. I just want to bless your heart. I just want to bless your heart Every day I wake up I just want to give you anything to bless your heart And I just want to bless your heart I just want to bless your heart Every day I wake up I just want to give you anything to bless your heart Every day I wake up I just want to give you Anything to bless your heart. Just Tino. <laughs> Man, that is strong. Just Tino, are you ready for the lightning round? So ready. All right, quick, chop, chop. You can do it. All Here right. we go. What band or songwriter is inspiring you right now? It's a guy named Aloe Black that I can't not play his music right now. It's it's feel good music. It's his melodies are ridiculous. That's my go to right now. Aloe Black. Yeah. All right. Never heard of him. There you go. Why is music powerful? 
music, one of its powers is it holds moments. Like if I hear James Taylor, I smell Javon Musk from my grand, or my uncle's Honda Accord where he took me to elementary school every day playing James Taylor. You know, it holds this like multiple senses, this moment for me all the way back from 1988. So I think that's one of the powers. One thing people would be surprised to know about touring. You work for, I said this earlier, you work for 23 hours and then you get one hour on stage and that's the glory hour or whatever you want to call it. The rest of it is, well, we drove here for 12 hours. Unless you're on a bus, then it's a little different, but not everybody's on a bus. And and we would show up to places and they think you're a celebrity. And, you know, and you're a celebrity to them, and you're like, no, 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 I just drove 12 hours through the night, spent a half hour in the hotel getting showered, and then I came out here on stage, and we'll do the same thing tonight. Key to maintaining relationships at home while you're away. Discipline. So when I, when I was home, I was home. And that's why my wife never begged me to come off the road. When I told her I was coming off the road, she went, what? It's going great. We have a great system, you know. But we were gone 150 nights a year, and you just stay disciplined. When I'm home, I'm home. When I'm on the road, I'm focused on the road, dialed in there. So you got to dial in at both places. Weirdest place you've heard your music, quote, unquote, in the wild? <laughs> I just got a text last night from a friend that lives in Cleveland, Ohio, and she said, hey, tonight during our Orange Theory class, your song made for this came on. <laughs> so I didn't hear it, but I've heard it in I've heard it in the mall in women's clothing stores when I'm there with my wife and I walk in and go, that's me singing. That's bizarre. When you hear it, you go, ooh, I'm, I just made some money. When you get royalties in that song? You get royalties, but it's pennies. So it? no, it's still, but it, it but the, the benefit, of, it's, I still geek out when I hear it. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? I remember the first time we heard a song on the radio, headed to a Reds game. And listening to a, a radio station here in town, and they said, "Hey, we got this new band, and and uh, it's from here in town." And I literally said to my wife, "Hey, hang on, I want to hear the, who this is." Turned it up. We're driving to a Reds game, date night, and he plays a song, and it's our song. I remember pulling off on the road, calling my bandmates who lived. At, some of them lived in Louisville, putting it on speakerphone, the whole deal. Like, uh, yeah, listen to this. Check this out. Yeah. So. I still feel that way when you hear it somewhere. I could imagine that'd be a thrill. Yeah. That's sweet. The one musician or singer that you would love to have lunch with? I'll give you who first came to my mind, Rich Mullins. So I th I don't know that we'd be friends based on the stories I've heard about oh, him. Oh, really? But I would be fascinated to sit with what him. What about him would, uh, would not want you to be his friend? No, the I think— he, The fact they smoked? No, no, gosh, no, no. All those things are why I would want to sit with him, right? He, the thing he did for Christian music, and yet he was a completely different character than what uh, Christian music, quote unquote, is or what everybody thought. He had something to say, and he said it. Uh, no, but he was. It, it's it's like when people are. I don't know when Christians are like. I love Paul's writings. I would love to have lunch with him. I'm like, I bet he's a hard individual. I bet he'd say some truth to you that you wouldn't be prepped to hear. And I think the same about Rich Mullins. I think he'd say it exactly like it is. And um, But I would love to. I've had a bunch of friends who knew him over the years. He would be the one because he's just, he's just himself. I think I would get fully him at a lunch. All right, last question, and not, not lightning round, but uh, talk to us about— Crossroads music. Let's say I've never listened to Crossroads music. What is it? What's different about it? Where should I begin? I think the, at the end of the day, we're trying to write songs for our church. You know, we're trying to write songs in our voice, in our unique way, not to impress our church, to help our church, to serve them. So we're trying to write songs that they could pop in. I don't know, pop in. I guess they pull it up on their phone. But songs that are useful to them every day. And so that matches, we, we talk about, I mean, from this podcast, aggressive life, adventurous life, Jesus has called you into adventure. We're trying to write the soundtrack for that adventure. 
And if someone wants to get Crossroads music, they would go to... Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, wherever you get your music. And if you want to stay up to date with us, go to our Instagram. And we'll, that's where we tell everybody what's coming out next and things like that. So, Okay, how about uh, where someone wants to follow up with you? What if they say, oh, I want to get all your music. I want to, I want to see everything you're posting. How can they follow what's going on with you? You have a social media account or anything like that? I have zero social media accounts, oh, right. Brian. Wow. haven't been on social media for four years. Sorry. So you were, and now you're not. I was. I ran all of our band social media. I had personal social media. And uh, I got exhausted by it and took a break to see uh, how, how would this break feel. It felt great, and I've never went back. No. So they can fax me. I can give you my fax number. Fax. Are you serious? You have a fax number? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, well, hey, you've been great today. Thanks so much for giving the time and lending us your amazing vocal cords. That's it we got for today, guys and ladies. It's really fun hearing from somebody in a different walk of life than the one that most of us are in, but yet we learn things, right? Justin's made some really aggressive moves and his life's the better for it. You can do the same no matter what wa your walk of life is. Make the move that may be a bit unorthodox, but may be the exact thing that'll cause your heart to sing years from now. We'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. Hey, thanks for listening. For all things aggressive living, why don't you head over to bryantome.com. Find my new book, Move, a guide to get up and go forward, as well as articles and much, much more. And no matter where you listen to podcasts, why don't you take a second and leave us a rating, leave us a review. It really, really helps us drive new listeners to the show. We want to help as many people as possible, just like we may have helped you. We want to help others. So why don't you help us out? And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram, at Brian Tome. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.